here I am again. New cup of coffee. Mm. So this is my new favorite place. I'm like my cat who discovers a new spot to nap. And uh, this is a little corner where I have some of my pen collection and I decided to move my pen repair area over here. And all I need is to get the stool back that I loaned a neighbor so she could see if the stool would help her back problem. And this stool is hard on my butt, my bony butt. I wish. So I just showed you minutes ago how much fun this nib was. Very, very fine. Just slightly flexible. And at the opposite extreme almost of this pen is this one. And this one is, is not fine, nor is it flexible. And it's such a different, a whole different kettle of fish. What does this kettle of fish have in it? Fish. But what kind of fish is the kettle cooking? This is really bony fish. Kind of ugly fish and bony. This is elegant and this is a kettle of minnows. Anchovies, maybe they'd be anchovies. There's sort of a sharpness to this nib that maybe is like anchovies, an acquired taste. Okay, why are you skipping? I'm using ink that is um, not only old and <laughs> dried up kind of, but then watered down with tap water. And when you use ink that's been so screwed up, you're bound to have issues with flow and color and stuff like that. So this is a kettle of anchovies. And it's they're little sparkly little fish. Really are neat. This one is a big old grouper, or I don't even know what a grouper looks like, but this pen is is one. If groupers don't aren't big and fat and slow and clumsy looking, they should be. Um, anyway, I was had this pen in my hand and I put it down like that and I did this and I I've been writing with this for a while so I'm I really understand how the nib works in my hands. But my friend Rob Morrison, who is a brilliant pen whisperer, I guess. Um, he, in addition to him understanding the nib, he understands all the other factoids that I find less interesting or not interesting. The factoids I don't find interesting, like what quarter of the 1944 did was this 51 made that is pretty dull in my book. He knows that kind of stuff. He also knows all sorts of other kinds of stuff about a particular pen, but he also has a brilliant way of explaining what it is about the length of the Moore section compared to the length of the Waterman section. And um, he uses different vocabulary than I might, 
but there's one term that he used and introduced me to, and this is how he would look at the pen. When he was a neighbor of mine, we would meet quite often over a pitcher of beer, which often turned to two pitchers of beer, which is why I don't drink anymore, because I had too many of those pitchers of beer. But we would, you know, show the pens that we are using and writing with them and whispering to them and whispering to each other and coming up with stuff. And he would, I would hand him a pen. I'd say, Rob, try this pen. I just got this. And he would look at it and admire it and figure out what quarter of 1944 the pen was made in or whatever. He would, all of that would be going into his computer brain. And um, the factoids would go into the computer half. But there was a half of the brain that, that was more analytical, not just gathering of facts, but taking facts and doing things with them. And then there was a part of his brain that I suppose would be, one might term poetic or something, that dealt with the feeling of the pen. And that's where he might talk about the length of the, the uh, more safe uh, section. But this is how he would, I'd hand him a pen and he would do, he'd look at it, calculate its date and whatever, and he would take it in his hand. He was left-handed, but I'm pretending he's right-handed, and he would do that, make a dot, and then he would do that and that. Usually this was the, or he might do that and look at it again, because maybe this dot surprised him in a way. And then he would do this and this, make a vertical line and a horizontal line. And then his brain had all of the information needed for him to go to the moon. It's like, you know, what's his name? The German guy that we stole from the, from, that, that we got, uh, his name. The guy that built the rockets to go to NASA. Anyway, it's like we had his brains. Rob has his brains. He knows, you know, how many gallons of fuel you need, you know, how long the rocket has to be. And then in his brain, he knows exactly what kind of line it's going to make. And he does something like this. And it's just really cool. It's like he needed to know these two things. I would just go right into this and um, miss the moon entirely and the poor astronauts would drift off to Saturn or Uranus. They'd end up in Uranus. And, um, but it's like he needed to have these factoids, these thoughts, these computations before he was able to make this line. And um, it was just really interesting watching him do that. I don't think he might have applied pressure maybe on the downstroke on that little tiny plus sign to, to ascertain its um, the flexibility, so when he made this line, he would, he would know how thick to make the line without ever pressing it down that hard. He knew the spring, spr springiness of the line only in this amount. Ted Clausen is someone that can do that too. He'll, he'll try a pen and he'll do this. Or he'll do that, and he'll he'll understand almost all the pen just by that line, and then he'll 
let's imagine he had a flexible nib. Even, you know, he'd press down and get a really flexible line later, but he knew that it could do that just by this practice doodle. And Rob seemed to know exactly what kind of line this would make only by that dot and that. Now this dot, we came up with the term. I mean, we didn't invent the term obviously, but we, that was the footprint. The footprint enlarged shows sort of the nib at rest and the shape of the iridium on the end had a height to it and a width to it. And in a way, there's no way to make a line or a part of a line be any smaller than that. Now there can be a way maybe if you go really, really fast and things like that, but that was sort of the, the basic line. That's the footprint it made. I guess when you make a, when you're walking, you're all parts of your shoe are on the ground at some point. Whereas if you're running, it's just the toe part, I guess, or I don't know, how does that work? So, uh, but the footprint was that thing. This, this little plus line, uh, Rob made was just proving essentially that we have a side stroke and a down stroke that have those dimensions. But on the downstroke, he also might have applied some pressure at some point in this, so it went from fatter to thinner down to this, or thinner to fatter if he applied pressure later. But I don't even think he did that. I think somehow he was able to figure out how flexible it was before he got to this point. Now maybe he, maybe I'm looking through it with bass ale colored glasses in my brain cells that that picture of deer destroyed are the ones that remember this exactly. But this little footprint, this thing that you should do, is sort of see you know what what you what you can get out of the dot the simplest little euclidean, euclidean mark you can make with the pen the point with the point of the pen make a point of a line and what can that tell you maybe it won't tell you anything what does it tell me on this one well, it's a smaller dot than this one. What does that tell me? I don't know. But again, it's... With Rob, he knew how to do it. He knew how to make that dot and that plus sign correctly. I don't know how... I don't have that ability. Um, but there's so many... I mean, these two pens are about as... These two nibs are about as different as they can get. This one is very firm, has, you know, there's a little tiny bit of pressure you can apply. It's not so much, it, is, it does flex only a tiny bit, but more of the broad line there seems to be happening because I'm really I think if I wrote normally with sort of a even pressure, my thin lines aren't as thin as I, when I'm trying to be calligraphic, where I really sort of lift the pen off the paper, which I don't do when I'm just writing words and thinking of words. I do handle it a little bit differently. So. I've put this pen in my pocket and I've been having a lot of fun with it of late because of its, it's a very wet, I would call this a broad nib, 
I would call it a broad nib. I don't know whether people that like broad nibs would think this is anywhere near a broad nib. And some people, some pen manufacturers would call this nib their extra fine because they don't know how to make fine nibs anymore. But um, it's really, it's really neat. This is a very different sort of nib than this one. The other term that Ted Clausen made that uh, I've developed a liking to is the term greeting the page. Now that sounds mystical and all that other kind of stuff that we don't really care about necessarily. But I think what it, greeting the page is what some other people might call smoothness. Maybe. But that's just part of greeting the page. Um, greeting the page is how it interacts with the paper while in motion. And I, I think of greeting the page as going from left to right, because that's how I write. And it's sort of how does this pen interact with the paper. And of course it depends on the paper, depends on how fast you write, depends on all that other kind of stuff. This one greets the page in a very I don't want to say aggressive way. It just knows it's in control. How does rock, paper, scissors go? The rock cover, no, the rock breaks the scissors, the scissors cuts the paper, the paper covers the scissors. The paper is not even considered. This, this pen doesn't even care. It's very smooth. It just does, it plows through the, the paper. It's like an icebreaker bow and it's cutting through the, the thin ice. Um, in the Arctic Ocean. It's just, it just, it has a job to do and it goes in on its job and it does what it does. It doesn't really interact with the paper in the way that this pen does. This pen, because of its fineness, it, the paper is almost an equal partner in how these, how the pen and paper get along together. This one is happy all by himself. This one, there, it's an equal play between the two of them. And greeting the page, this one says hello and the paper says hello back. That's not exactly what, I don't think Ted meant greeting in the sense of saying hello to your neighbor and tipping your hat as you're walking down the street to the tobacconist but it's starts there but it sort of implies that there's a conversation to follow and, the, and it's a relationship between the paper and the pen this doesn't have a relationship with the paper it just uses the paper to leave its trail of ink and destruction behind. Now it, this, I'm exaggerating a little bit here, but th because this is so smooth, it, it doesn't, it doesn't care what the paper thinks. It's just gonna talk. It's like when you run into people that just love to talk and you they pretend they're interested in what you have to say 
but they don't allow you to say it. That's what this pen is like. This one wants a dialogue. But I'll have to find out from, from Ted how he would describe greeting the page using language that I understand better. <laughs> I understand better. I might have this entirely wrong. And Rob might say, Pure, you're so wrong in that little dot, in that little plus sign. sign. I, you know, but I don't think I'm wrong. I think he knows exact. he's getting 99% of the information about how this nib will handle based on that dot in that plus sign. He'll know that it will make it to the moon. Vanderberg, that's not his name. Van Doren, that's not his name. What the hell is his name? That German. Anyway, he will know that this will make it to the moon based on that. I have to... I don't know or count how many gallons I'm filling the rocket with, and I don't know how tall the rocket is. I haven't done any of the math. I just want to see if it gets to the moon, so I just press go. I don't even... I'm too impatient. I don't even start the countdown at 10. T minus 10. I just... 3, 2, 1, go. Or sometimes go. <laughs> I don't even let the astronauts get on the goddamn thing. So... And of course it misses, it misses completely the moon, and it ends up in Uranus. <sighs> you know, when will I ever grow up? Put your, write your answers below.